Hi guys, we're going to be doing something that is quite long, I'm afraid, um, but I said I'd put it through, so I am doing it. This is the long version of the refutation or the, uh, I'm, I'm just simply addressing a webinar that somebody called Mohammed Hijab held or presented with on a platform. And it's about the Quran preservation, where it's, the claim is that the Quran is protected, um, it is preserved, nothing can be changed. So the webinar's name is The Holes in the Quran Preservation Narrative Exposed. Um, like I said, I, I did a basic video where I've, I sort of gave an overview over what is happening, a very quick one. And this is now the more detailed, the slide by slide covering the entire, well, close to two hours of this webinar. And this was on the, on the Sapiens, on, on the Sources platform. And I, I don't know, maybe Hijab was fired from my era following his emotional meltdown <laughs> with these sexually explicit claims and then the personal attacks of critics and their families. I don't know. Whatever the case may be, it seems that he was picked up by sources, muzzled, uh, you know, told, listen, tone down, don't do this in public. You can do this at home, but not in public. And he can now present his pretty, well, childish attempts at whitewashing Islam on the Sapiens platform. Now, he also, and this is quite telling, he needs a vanity page, all right? He's, he's not on, on Wikipedia or something, so he, he seems to create his own. And does he have four or six or 18 or something degrees? No way, come on. I mean, he's a simpleton with huge complexes and a, and a chip on his shoulder trying to be what he's not. If you look at what he claims, the, when the university doesn't seem to have a Master of History course. So he says he's got a Master of History from this university, but they don't even offer it. Now, in his bio, he says he's acquiring a Master, or did he do one? I don't know. It, tertiary education, in my eyes, should teach a person structure, rationality, logical, as well as critical thinking. And it should instill some degree of intellectual honesty. None of these has happened with our little hijab. <laughs> now, I've demonstrated multiple times what a dishonest character this is and that nobody should trust him. Like here, this is my comment on one of his videos. It exists. And then if somebody else logs in, the comment is gone. Intentionally hidden from others. Is that intellectually honest? Nah. And on, on top of that, he threatens critics of Islam along with their wives and children. That's how weak he is, because he's incapable of addressing their arguments intellectually. He even instructs followers with detailed instructions on how to go and destroy their financial income. Now, luckily, the video was swiftly removed from YouTube for bullying and harassment, but this is the kind of a person this hijab is. Okay, we... Why, why I'm actually making this video is we, we need to show everyone else that hijab is a shady character, someone who is out to get others, you know, a person who thinks of himself as an intellectual giant, but is too scared to actually talk to someone like me outside of a controlled environment, which is his controlled environment, where he has control over the microphone and what gets commented later. When challenged to a neutral debating environment, he runs and he hides because he's never actually refuted an argument presented to him. It's always deflection and, and goal, goalpost shoving, moving around and things. And then the second thing is we need to show this guy. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm hoping that hijab, somebody tells hijab about it. I doubt that he's going to watch this, but maybe somebody will tell hijab that nobody actually takes him seriously outside his easily impressed Muslim fanboys. And we must focus on the contents he's presenting, like here, not on Ayira, but on a different platform. And here... Because he doesn't have the required training and knowledge, he does what he was told not to do. He screws it up, just as Dr. Yasir Qadi predicted he would. Not only damaging Islam, by the way, but actually destroying conventional Islam by causing cracks in the very foundation. Now, nobody takes him seriously because he simply can't do anything convincing outside his clown act on a, on a stage. So all that is left for him are the hardcore fanboys he needs to impress. And they don't think, but, you know, they obey and are impressionable. 
He runs like for something to be persuasive, it doesn't have to be true. That's his motto, it must be. Now, to me, he's a troubled person, a closeted gay or something. And I, I see it more and more because, you know, it's still unacceptable in traditional Islam. And it would explain his emotionally unstable personality and emotional outbursts, his dishonesty, I suppose. But like I said, let's turn from the speaker to the speech and analyze what he put together in the presentation on the Islamic text, the Quran. And then look at the preservation claim, slide by slide, this time all 22 of them. <clears throat> I would ignore his storm and inside the storm and inside and so on, where he suddenly starts screaming about Christians and the Bible or Jews or like all the times he simply screams and rants and raves and it gets undecipherable. Why are you mad? Why are you mad? Why some people have been calling me and giving me some females? Brother, I have doubts. What doubts, man? Why embarrassment is that? Why I have doubts? Why? The Orientals, you've read them, if you read their works, you'd be, you'd be surprised that more are fighting, they're against us. You'd be surprised, they're lying, you'd be surprised. And some of the Orientals come out and say, these Orientals, they don't know what the Orientals say. Some of them actually are good, that's not against you. But tell me now, you find any manuscript in the whole wide world, in the whole wide world, or you find me a singular narration which goes against the Quran and the Osmanic blasphemy. So this has a great explanation of this opinion of the W. I would agree, it has a great explanatory scope. And it allows us to, ex to explain all of the differences within the Quran that we have and we read the Quran with. And all of the differences that may emerge outside from a manuscript perspective or from a narration perspective. Tell me now, tell me now how Orientals has any argument against the Quran and preservation of Quran. Tell me now. Bismillah, you are deceived and self-deluded. Dunning Kruger affect you, jokers, you imbeciles. How dare you talk about the Quran, you imbecilic individuals? Salat and this and that and the Sahaba are going to beat each other up because they didn't know. Is this what I'm saying? Get the hell out of here! Get the hell out of here! And these Muslim, weak Muslims in the, in the West, sending me emails and this, I'm using my face and I'm a half I'm going to get the hell out of here. You are never a trouble even in the first place, you weakling. You are a weakling because you don't know your tradition. You're sitting there watching Netflix and you don't read the books of Islam. That's why you are where you are. That's why you are where you are, you imbecile. It's our fault. It is amazing that there is anyone who takes this guy and his clown act seriously, really. It is telling that Muslims adore, well, okay, not also, some Muslims adore him when all he does actually is damage Islam. No, oh, and actually he insults Muslims when, when he says, well, you guys don't get it and, and, you know, just take notes and this is much too difficult and so on. This is a bit, a bit weird. And he claims he was a teacher. Oh, boy. Okay. Let's go to the boring stuff, the serious refutation of the claims made on his slides. And thankfully, hijab does not go and do the usual 7th century superstitious, ritualistic, ritualistic mumblings, but jumps right in. He claims he will address all controversies surrounding the preservation claim of the Quran and present the solutions as well. Really? Well, let's see in the end whether he really manages to do that. Now, in slide two, I quite like that he first explains what this is about. It shows us a slide with a quote showing a claim from the Quran. There are more sentences like this in the book, all claiming very similar things. The Quran is protected, nothing can be changed, it's preserved, and it's always the same. But is the text really identical to the one released over a thousand years ago? Now, the claim made in the Quran is supposed to be something special. But there are countless books where the contents has never changed, and they were not written by gods or goddesses. In fact, it's a positive characteristic that a non-fiction text is updated. We've even developed version control and management processes to ensure a text is up to date. The Quran does not have that and is hopelessly outdated, something I've demonstrated in hundreds of videos and essays. And that's why in Saudi they're looking at this to see if it's not time to update it. What I dislike here, this is what I mentioned earlier, this is the arrogance on display where hijab, he, he's the guy preaching. He, he's not somebody who's teaching, you know, pupil something. He tells listeners they will not grasp this difficult material, where in reality, this is very basic. And he, hijab, is the one who is unable to grasp the finer details. He has to make stuff up and pretend that he's knowledgeable here. He was actually told by a scholar of Islam, by Dr. Yasir Kali, to stay away from this until he was adequately trained and had the level of knowledge required to address this. Hijab ignores this advice at his peril. What I miss is any form of intellectual honesty, something a person who claims he has so many degrees, I mean, she should have acquired some of this somewhere along the, in the process. He does not show what the variants are and 
why there are variants and types of variations there are and why Islamic scholars are suddenly admitting that the standard narrative of the Quran has holes in it. In other words, he can't adequately answer questions around these topics. Like the claim preservation of the text where we ask questions how that claim is justified given the thousands of variations we have here in the real world. He cannot address this. And I, okay, I, I freely admit that for me, commenting here and now, it's easy to stop and research. In Speaker's Corner or during a seminar, I would not be able to do so and could not even verify what is being said. So, yeah, I have a huge advantage here. I can go and I can research. So I find the message that Islamic scholars in KSA in, in Saudi Arabia are thinking about Reformation an update of the Quran to correct the thousands of errors, inconsistencies and contradictions to make it more accessible to the reader in the 21st century. They realize the inherent textual problems and try to take a practical approach. I mean, readers whose brain is stuck in the 7th century are welcome to keep the old Quran with all the errors, mistakes and everything. So. Right from the word go, we have to acknowledge that everything hijab says is not really related to reality, unfortunately. So on slide three, he shows us 11 topics he will cover, and I'll briefly address each one of them, ignoring the final questions, of course, which are not part of the prepared presentation. Slide four, is there a controversy? Well, it's a question. Well, yes, there is. Of course, <laughs> that's why he's there. But the, the, the controversy is that the Quran makes the claim that it is preserved, that it is protected, and not a word can be changed. And if we look at reality, we see thousands of changes in hundreds of variant texts. We notice there are alterations, additions, corrections, deletions, omissions across all the different texts and differences in the contents textual differences that change the contents significantly. Like here in the Hafsa version, most of the user day, it says fought in the wash, it says were killed. That's quite a difference. Or here where it says he revealed, and then we reveal, which is also substantially different. Now, how can you find like, like 2,200 and I don't know how many mistakes if there is not a single one? And in one, it says they were Muslims, and another one, he says they were not. So these, this is the opposite. So to simply claim that there are no differences in the text regarding contents, and then instead addressing the pronunciation, the differences in, in the way that words are being said, like tomato, tomato. and tomato, tomato, to only one thing. It's a giant strawman, a logical fallacy, a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. Now, it takes hijab less than four minutes to completely derail the discussion and waste everybody's time with useless babble, because that's all he's going to talk about. Pronunciation and words which are synonyms when they are not. Now, it's Muslim researchers, not, not non-Muslim. No, Muslim researchers have found thousands, these, these 2,277 mistakes, and mostly due to repetition of minor spelling errors. Because if you have a word like month, which is spelled um, wrong in, in one instance, this, you know, because it's repeated often, this then amounts to 100 or 200 um, mistakes. But hijab does not address any of this. He doesn't understand that the, the humongous and absolute claims made in the Quran are no longer valid. The Quran has become unreliable. And a problem, by the way, he himself has created by pushing a scholar to admit to a problem area in the Quran. So his damage control now is too little, too late and woefully incompetent. He eventually tries to address the textual variance and fails. He pretends that all differences have been identified and make up the grand total of 19 minor differences. But the claim, come, I mean, you know, it, it is and remains zero, not 19. What are these 19 differences? Well, hijab skips that. Now, let's be clear, even one variant would show that the Quran is unreliable. 
Now, it seems that I expect more from hijab's God, you know, a perfect God, the best of everything, and every, than hijab himself seems to expect from his God. Hijab doesn't seem to mind the inept and incompetent writings of the Quran. Okay, slide five, divine origins. In the next slide, Hijab simply goes into preaching about the, the Dharma script. Now, here in the real world, historians like Dr. Daniel Brubaker have written entire books listing and explaining all the differences between the old texts, showing the evolution of this book over the centuries. And actually, I could stop here since the Hijab presentation gets a straight F for fail, since he does not address the topic. But I want to inspect the rest of the slides just for fun and for, you know, just to be complete. Yeah. So far, the obvious conclusion is that this text has no divine origin, but it's obviously man-made, nothing more. Now, slide six is the Arab context where hijab repeats the standard narrative of how Muslims believe the Quran contents was assembled and constructed, omitting the many contradicting accounts found in the same collections of hadiths or traditions of Muhammad. These are stories, none with any corroborating evidence whatsoever. He makes an emotional appeal to the linguistic and memorization capabilities of the Arabs in the 7th century, ignoring that Arabic was not a fully developed language yet and had only rudimentary writing and grammatical rules. The Quran codified it. And then claiming that the people appreciated beauty does not in any way serve as evidence for the veracity of the text or that the claims are indeed justified. Now, slide seven. Well, okay, hijab asserts that thousands of people memorize the text. Really? Now, number one, this doesn't serve any real purpose. It's useless information. And number two, unfortunately, it's also wrong. We have texts, okay? We, we have hadith which are classified by Islamic scholars as authentic, as sahih, telling us about the dire situation where only one single person was available who could remember a certain sentence or certain sentences of a particular chapter. Not thousands, one. Other stories tell us that Muhammad himself forgot sentences and how people influenced him to add or modify passages which are found in the Quran today. And some, some of these stories even mention passages that are completely missing in the Quran that we have today. We have Muhammad telling people they could recite the sentences any way they wanted. So there is no single version of the Quran. And then slide eight, we go to the assembled collection. Now, the information on this slide is, is just conjecture. Adding the word sciences at the bottom does not improve this. The situation is further complicated by the fact that individual folios have appeared, showing that the claims are false, and that human beings simply wrote the book using older bits and pieces, some from, from, you know, from the 6th century, and even older, before the claimed birth of Muhammad, the messenger. The existing stories of Indian, Jewish, Christian, all these texts, they were added, even though they were badly misunderstood at times. And that's why Isa, the Islamic version of Jesus, appears many centuries earlier as grandson of Imran, a nephew of Aaron and Moses, or the Haman from Babylon is suddenly the chief builder in Egypt. So there are countless examples of these mistakes, again, making the claim of a divine origin impossible. So, come on, to be honest, one would have to simply admit that nobody today knows who wrote the Quran, where it was written, or when it was written. What we do know is that Mecca was not on a trade route, was not mentioned before the 7th century, and does not fit the geological or agricultural claims. The story of the ascension of Muhammad, the messenger to Jerusalem in heaven via a flying donkey, come on, that's fabricated. Since, I mean, little things like the mosque where he ties up this, this miracle flying creature and he goes inside to pray was built a hundred years after Muhammad's alleged death. In addition, there is no evidence that Muhammad physically existed at all, as described in the Sunnah. So the entire narrative is dubious at best. Which takes us to slide number nine, the Uthmanic Assembly. 
Now, the, the same as was said as my reaction to previous slides, this, this also applies here. Made up, fabricated stories bar any tangible evidence. And as I also mentioned before, the issue we're talking about are the variants, very different versions of the Quran, where entire words and sentences are different, missing, corrected or added, not the pronunciation or using synonyms. Now, Dijab mentions that people argued about different versions and popularity decided what went into the Quran in what way. And he says there was no standard copy and then points to the copy in Medina. What was this a copy of? Was this the original? Why did it take so many people if everyone got the same version via the angel, via the messenger, via the scribes? Now, the material used in the, for example, the Topkapi Quran in Turkey, he mentions, stems from the mid-8th century. It's different from other copies of the Quran and is different from today's book. That is what we are talking about, because that is what the Quran is talking about. Now, if Hijab can't handle this, I suggest he goes back to take a course with Dr. Yasekari. To take the class, I do this class, it'll be one year later. Choose those whom you feel most comfortable with and then be quiet about the rest. Simple as that. And no, we, the Quran, and the rest of mankind is not talking about a recitation nobody can verify. The Quran does not say we preserve the recitation. It says we protect the words. We protect the book. None of the words can be changed. And it doesn't mention a voice. It mentions the original tablets. And the standard question remains, where are these originals and where is the original here on earth if it was indeed protected and guarded? Where is the original? Now the Quran mentions the original, original, original Quran on golden tablets in heaven, where gold seems to be an item. But where are they today? Why aren't these tablets, the original Quran, here on earth where they can be accessed? If I go to heaven, I don't care anymore what the original says, do I? Now, why can't Muslims agree whether it was uncreated or created? It should be very easy. If created, why can't they agree on how the Quran was created? Why do you need groups to compile a single book? Why can't an all-powerful and perfect God ensure only one coherent version of the divine demands is provided so that everyone gets the same information? Is that too much for an all-powerful God? Too much to ask from an all-merciful God? Too much to expect from an all-knowing God? So what we see in the real world only makes sense if indeed the Quran was man-made here on planet Earth. And the slide nine on the assembly, the, I don't know, the unbelievable ignorance and, and deceit, it just simply continues. Nobody knows who arranged the chapters in this chaotic way. And you can see here that it, they are vaguely in some sort of order. But it's, come on, is this the best a, a, an all-powerful, all-knowing God can do? I can do better than that. To me, it seems as though they lost the proper sequence and simply gave up and then added and then uh, deleted and then some things were missing. And, and, and this makes a lot more sense than the official thing that I hear from hijab. And that's why we have some sentences covering several topics and then a topic covered by several sentences or a mix where, for example, look at this example. The inheritance sentences or, or paragraphs or whatever you want to call them, are there's two in sequence and then the third is right at the end of the chapter as though someone had forgotten it. It belongs there in 413 and not in 176. So... Pfft, this is a perfect example of showing that there is something wrong here. So no, there is no proper sequence because nobody knew a proper sequence. That's why we have zero structure in the Quran where not even the descending length of sentences is maintained. It's totally chaotic, totally unstructured. Now I, I would be too ashamed to admit responsibility for such shoddy workmanship and incompetence especially if I were a god. 
Sorry, no. This only makes sense if the Quran was man-made here on planet Earth by people who were pretty ignorant, had no version control, and just cobbled it together, I don't know, in a, as short a time as possible, like over a thousand years ago. The same applies when looking at the various readings. If I create humans and demand they do something, and that is, worship me, I need to somehow make this known to them. If I were a powerful creator god, I would implant the message into the brain so it can't be forgotten and it can't be mixed up or misunderstood. Now, if I were a human who would want to recruit soldiers, I would write a book where I promise them a huge reward if they fight for me, for, um, for, for, for their god, and pay them out after they are dead. I would use these extortion tactics and threaten them with immense torture for eternity to entice them to come and fight for me, and even promise those who die in the process some sort of special treatment. Now, would a God, an all-merciful God, do this? Would a God demand, like, a cut of pillaged goods the way it is demanded in the Quran? Now, a human will write a book and cater for dialects and local customs, creating variants which will later have to be denied or explained away. A god would simply make people understand the same book. Or is this too high expectation of a god? Now, a human will write a book and cater for dialects and local customs, creating variants which will later have to be denied or explained away. A god would simply make people understand the same book. Or is this too high an expectation of a God? Am I expecting too much of a perfect God who claims to have authored a perfect text? The next claim is that you know, other or previous copies were burnt. Well, that's a shame because we have old folios appear which seem to have escaped the promised process. They were not burned. God slipped up here again, it seems. It's nice that they all approved of this chaos and complete mess. Quite honestly, I would have preferred a God to come around and sort things out, to make it perfect the way a God would do stuff, and not like this. Now, it's all right, it's cute to put two sources into the footnotes, but it's like, you know, adding a source when talking about pigeons in the story of Cinderella. The hunting for the word of God is available on the net, and I found it it's just primitive apologetics against Christians, using fairy tales and claims, unsubstantiated claims, nothing more. So, apart from creating a gigantic storm in here, hijab can't do anything productive other than appeal to fairy tales. That brings us to slide 10 about doubts. Now we're presented with irrefutable evidence mm -hmm. that everything claimed in the fairy tales is actually the truth and nothing but the truth, so help him God. It's a simple yet powerful statement. Any doubts are unfounded. There you go. It's that easy. Doubts are unfounded, so we can close the case and put the stamp solved on it. Come on, really? It's more a case of... Doubts are unwanted or even prohibited. As the Quran says, don't ask questions where the answer might cause you doubt. Are, uh, really, are Islamic apologists really this dumb? Or even more importantly, are followers really this credulous to accept something this flimsy? Is the Islam virus this potent to wipe out all rational and critical thinking capabilities? Just look at this really amazing collection of trumped-up reasons and then stop hitting your forehead. Distribution? What distribution? He said five copies, at least five copies, or maybe 15, or whatever number you fancy, were to be sent. Who sent them to whom, when, and by what means? Who who received them? Who said, ah, this is what the... Did they then exchange different variants to see if there are variants? Did they compare them? That, come on. There was, there was no Islamic state at the time. There were just some captured regions run as colonies. And why this nebulous term, head of state? Ah, I think it's very easy because nobody knows who did what and when. And different Muslim scholars make different claims. So we don't know who at the end of the day did something and anyone's guess is as good as yours. So was there ever a single codex? If yes, where is it? 
It's always the same question. Now, it's supposed to be protected and guarded and preserved by an all-powerful God, so where the hell is it? Was it finished 13 or 15 years after date X? We don't know date X. We don't know who finished it. <laughs> this does not convey a lot of confidence, does it? <laughs> Would doubts be in order if we were finished after 16 years? What is the cutoff time here? Why exactly should I accept that doubts are unfounded if a document is finished after 13 to 15 years? <laughs> this is so funny. The, the head of this non-existent state removes any doubt? How so? How does the presence of one guy remove all doubts regarding the compilation of an old book? I mean, not even a god can prevent variants, omissions, mistakes and all the other inconsistencies, and he couldn't prevent them to show up. So how could one guy, and how could all the other men, when most could not even read or write anyway? We have versions of the Quran where the experts today simply chuckle and note that the scribes did not speak the language very well, nor did they master writing. And how could they? The language was, you know, was just developing and had not, you know, the, the grammatical rules were not complete yet and had not been spread around. So then Hijab claims that the original text of Abu Bakr was used. When just a few slides earlier, he talked about tablets. Well, tablets of white stone and said the text was also taken from the skins of animals, ribs, palm leaves and bones. So which is it? We have additional stories about different people like Hafsa, a wife of Muhammad, providing input. So the final point in Hijab's case for rejecting any kind of doubt is that they all agreed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, come on, in summary, it's safe to say that nobody really knows who did what, where and what happened to the finished product, or even if there was a product at all. Okay, slide 11 is, uh, okay, this is quite adventurous. <clears throat> Because Hijab makes an astonishing claim. There's a version of a Quran somewhere that is 99% complete. He provides a source, a Muslim apologetics website, and one I've had multiple fights with in the past. And, okay, they are more precise and state it's the Topkapi Quran located in Istanbul. They also provide sources to Turkish professors who have studied old versions of different Qurans they had access to being Muslims. According to their evaluation of these Muslim scholars, there are several thousand differences and mistakes in the different versions. And this table, for example, shows that the number 99% complete is hardly justified. But it could be the, you know, the, the oldest near complete version of the Quran. I mean, the, we always have to remember the dating goes you know, for the material. And if you want to destroy the ink, then you can also um, sort of date the time range when the ink was um, created, was, was mixed or, or concocted or whatever you do with it. But it, it still doesn't tell you when it was written. We, we must be aware that we're talking sometime in the 8th century and that the pages, the material again, okay, not the text, that this was produced, 8th century. Okay, so... The text came later, obviously, so we're talking about a copy of a copy of a copy and no original in sight. And that in spite of all the claims in the Quran and what Islam apologists today would like to see. Slide 12, objection number one. Now, Hijab turns to slide 12 and the journey into the wild and wonderful fairy tales continues. There are narrations compiled centuries after the alleged events saying that parts of the Quran existed. Yet, in the version mostly used today, the Hafsa version released in 1924 in Cairo, they're missing. In spite of these thousands of companions that Tijab claimed to had memorized the entire Quran, crucial sentences are missing, maybe eaten by a goat. And nobody knew or noticed. This is how the Quran is protected, that you couldn't even stop a goat eating off the Quran or some sentences from the Quran. And so they couldn't complete the book, a book protected and guarded by an all-powerful God, right? Really? Come on. And people today are getting brutally stoned to death without the relevant command in the Quran. How so? Because a goat ate these commands? Really? 
Half the entire population of Muslims cover themselves in the most demeaning and inhumane way without the relevant command in the Quran? Because a goat ate these commands? Come on, you must be joking. Who takes this seriously? The sad consequence is that in spite of missing sentences in the Quran in many countries, most Muslims favor stoning as a penalty, simply due to the narrations based on Muhammad, the messenger. And callous people without empathy like hijab do nothing to stop these brutal practices based on Islam, and quite the opposite. They fuel them and propagate the brutal Sharia of the 7th century. So they come up with these piss-poor excuses like a god realizing a mistake has been made, changing their mind, taking back sentences that had existed in this form for billions and billions and billions of years. If, if you know in advance that alcohol is bad for your favorite creation in the long run, don't create it and don't make it available to them. Instead, letting them die from it and cause endless harm and only wean them off like after a couple of zillion whatever years. Well, some of them anyway. But that's crazy. That is crazy. That no, no, that it's, I, I can't understand why somebody can make this claim that a God actually came up with this idea. Now, again, his source and approach to Quranic sciences, and I found it is also available online. And it shows the copy paste effort from the pages to the slides and actually makes for a fascinating reading. Now, Cinderella has always fascinated me too, by the way. <laughs> and this, this applied, this, this no true Scotsman fallacy here with little Aisha does not save anything. It only makes it worse. And what was new for me is the reference to ten ridat. I've never heard this ridat and I can't even find any text explaining it. Okay, next slide. This slide is a bit of a mystery for me anyway. Maybe Hijab was desperate to get some more stuff from the book in here. And why should anyone care that some blog said in an essay that someone said the last chapters are not part of the Quran? And it does not say which chapters or why. The apologetic is equally baffling, simply speculating. I have no clue what this slide is doing here and what the relevance is for the topic of Quran variants. Okay, now we get to slide 14. <laughs> this is hilarious. How he just demonstrates how people in the Muslim group are taught what to think and not how to think. Listen to this. Should be taking your notes here and being very careful. Yes. Think what, this is what you're going to write on top of the page. What other app are you going to underline it with two lines? You're going to underline it with two lines. Now we get to what nobody on this planet understands or can explain what it is doing or what it is supposed to do, why we have it. And where every scholar disagrees with everybody else. It's about the different recitations or dialects or local words or substitutions, whatever you want to call them. So you get the different linguistic, lexical, phonetic, morphological and syntactical forms permitted with reciting the Quran, according to Wikipedia. And there's supposed to be 10 of them. Why? What are they? Where, where do they come from? Why were they there? Who was using them? What makes matters worse is that you also get the so-called aruf, which are modes allowing for textual variations. And now nobody knows what's going on any longer. I have no idea who ordered this. It shows how laughable the entire Quran actually is and how ridiculously childish the claims are that Muslims must believe and that we should believe. That the single source for the Quran and the whole of Islam heard the sentences in different ways and managed to repeat them using seven different dialects and ten different ways of accessing them and then everything is the same. Using different expressions for the same thing when the language wasn't even complete yet and was just developing. With the Quran codified Arabic, but everything was the same. We're supposed to believe that a book contains ten different syntactical forms with seven different local dialects, but is identical. Hijab says we should have variants, just not the variants we have. Just variants that don't change the contents. Is that what we find in the real world? No, we don't. Here we have hundreds of different versions of the Quran, the main ones being Hafs and Wash, with immense differences in contents, mind you, not just pronunciation or varying expressions. And nobody knows 
which one is actually correct because we don't have a original text. And hijab was warned by Dr. Yasikadi to stay away from this without adequate training and education. And hijab ignores this <laughs> and he makes a mess. A mess so severe that it actually shakes Islam in its foundations at the moment. And he, hijab, single-handedly showed that the Quran is unreliable and contains errors. It is neither preserved nor protected, nor is anyone guarding it. All this is gone. And we're talking about real differences, different words, sentences with different contents, sometimes saying the opposite of what the Quran says in its 1924 Hafs version in use today. And that is reality. That is the real world when you start researching without stopping short of a red line. That was the second admission by Yasakadi, and a huge one at that. And he freely admits Islam scholars will research the Quran up to a certain point only. And when they run into discrepancies or real issues, they turn back and close their eyes. Now this eliminates any kind of objective or honest results from Islamic scholars. We cannot accept them as source, as reliable researchers. That's gone. And then the third sensational and probably the most significant admission made by Yasegadi is that information is deliberately and intentionally withheld from the broad Muslim community. This is huge. And it shows Muslims and Muslim apologists in particular that their level of knowledge is incomplete and false. They can't use what they are being taught as a basis. They are shown only a part of the picture and are arguing for an incomplete base or foundation. Now we as critical observers should make apologists aware of their predicament and ask on what basis they are making their point and that they most probably don't have the full information because they have stayed away from the red line. But maybe this is why it's so easy to refute their arguments. Now, case in point, hijab shows a text, a narration from some hadith collections, which were compiled centuries after the Quran to provide an explanation of the Quran through Muhammad concerning the applied text in everyday life. Now, he argues that the Quran would only exist in one form. It would contradict the hadith. That is the Islam virus at work. He does not realize that if the Quran would only exist in one form, the hadith we see here would not exist, would it? And then it would not contradict the hadith which says this, if it didn't, you know? It's logical thinking. So, slide 15 is just a contradiction where the process described that is obvious to hijab is not shared by everyone and scholars disagree with each other what happened when and why and what goes where and why and how. It shows the entire Quran creation was obviously performed by humans. You can't get away from this. And then in slide 16, he actually goes into this topic of the Kira'at, which he started earlier on. Now, he tries to tackle a really complicated bit of Islamic textual analysis, which he started on slide 4, by the way. And he claims there are 10 Kira'at, or maybe more. 10 ways of accessing the Quran. And that's nonsense. What happened, and I confess, I don't fully comprehend what is going on here, since there are so many conflicting stories. And it's that apparently the Arabic at the time had not fully formed yet, so there were still variants in linguistic, lexical, phonetic, morphological, syntactical forms. So everybody just used what they heard, passed on the contents using their local dialect. But this was around 300 years after Hijra, and the practice was accepted another century later. So the most common Quran version in use today is the Hafs version, as read by someone called Asim, codified and then released. It was 1918 and then 1924 released in Cairo. And this is the version most commonly in use today. Now Hijab claims he or someone he quotes can trace this person by person all the way to Muhammad the Messenger if he existed, that is. So then, why do scholars disagree with each other if this was so clear? Why do we see so many mistakes, all these inconsistencies and the, the contradictions? The, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. 
Of course, the Quran was massaged, updated, modified, and changed. And this happened for, I don't know, over 300 years. And that is what we see. This is why we see all these variants. We see all the changes and the additions, the omissions, and things like that. Now, Hijab, for some reason, concedes that there are around 700 differences in different Qurans. 700. The claim is zero, man. Zilch. Nothing. Nichts. Rien. Nichevo. Well, you get the point. He said right in the beginning, it is guarded without any changes. And now he says, well, 700, no big deal. And he says, well, so what if this represents only 1%? Man, the claim is 0% by a god. Would you get into a plane where 1% of all flights crash? <laughs> I doubt it. And look up Six Sigma and understand what the numbers are and why people still fly. And this is why gods don't construct aeroplanes. <laughs> and, you know, you can look things up using Google or whatever search engine you, you prefer. And the Islamic God apparently did not have Google. What a pity. Okay, slide 17, explanatory power. Now, the word explanatory is one of the favorite words of Islam apologists. Well, it actually means nothing. I can explain anything and make a complete mess of it, saying absolutely nothing of value. An explanation itself is not necessarily useful or correct or true, since it's personal, it can be anything. So again, we have differences of opinion, no single version of a Quran in sight. Hijab must be aware of this, since all he does now is scream in frustration, making it worse, saying he accepts variants. Oops. Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's tone it down a bit. <laughs> Slide 18, the objections. And this is now just an internal discussion where different people have different views about these concepts, like discussing the type of glass used to make the magical glass slipper worn by Cinderella. It does not help the cause in any way. So slide 19, I call Chinese whispers, because now towards the end, we're experiencing what sheer desperation smells like. Seriously, how can evidence showing the non-existence of a textual error be an oral tradition? Come on. We're talking about the text of the Quran and how we have countless differences, as in alterations, omissions, additions, corrections, substitutions, and updates of entire sentences. The Chinese whispers game is still valid and will be as long as humans have this annoyingly stupid and fallible brain. Under no circumstances can this show that textual errors don't exist. And here's an expert in the field demonstrating a mistake where in one folio the word Allah was forgotten or needed to be added manually later so that it matches what we see in the Quran today. So. Not only is there no preservation of the written text, we have no idea which version is the correct one and what version was used for recitation after the text was compiled and released. And it is not. And I, I need to repeat this to give the brains of Hijab and his fanboys time to process this. It is not. It is not about the pronunciation of Arabic words. It is not about tomato or tomato. But tomato and donut, or tomato and nothing. I, I did not know how to graphically represent nothing. So I did something and that was nothing. <laughs> now, the paragraphs in the lower half of the slide just have me shaking my head in disbelief. First, it's the giant strawman of addressing pronunciation instead of omission, addition, correction, or updating the text itself. Then, it's what he's just claimed, that the only difference are pronunciation. Then he says that pronunciation can change, and then says it does not. It is also preserved, adding the word science. Well, now that is nonsense. And it shows, A, how desperate he is to make it you know, sound like something substantial and precise, and B, how little he understands about anything scientific. His red herring journey within the strawman and his knowledge claim regarding the native language of Moses, uh, it's quaint, but not more. Nobody knows what language was spoken at the time, so the few literate persons would have used Canaanite or something. 
which gradually emerged, by the way, in Israel and Judah as Hebrew, and one of the Sumerian dialects as Akkadian. But nobody really knows. And what I try, what we're trying to do, inshallah, in this uh, webinar is I'm going to try and go through all of the controversies and all of the solutions to the controversies. So did hijab keep his promise and address all controversies surrounding the preservation claim of the Quran? No, not one, not a single one. All we got was excuses and threats, rambling and babbling. Nothing even remotely interesting or convincing. A total failure, I'm sorry to say. Okay, then finally there were some questions and I'm not, well, there's one question I need, I need to address or at least highlight because somebody did ask why Sheikh Yassi Akadi say that the standard narrative has holes in it. Now, the reply by Hijab, because he made a mistake. Dr. Yasir Kadi made a mistake, and this is why they had to delete the videos. This is why there are holes in, in the standard narrative, and Yasir Kadi doesn't understand this, because Hijab understands it, but Yasir Kadi doesn't. And Shabi Ali does not understand this, but Hijab understands this. There you go. That's why he censored the video, right? And then deleted it completely, by the way. Oh boy. Okay. I hope I provided a bit of insight and this was not too boring, even though this is quite a long video. So I see you soon and I thank you for your time. See you in the next video. Bye.